Welcome back to Go Fund This. Today I've got another comic book guest. It seems like we're on a roll with these lately. Uh, I'm sure it's probably due to when COVID hit. Now everyone's got their projects going. Uh, but today I have Scott Harris King with me, and I am really excited to talk to you, Scott. Uh, this is such a cool project. Let's get into it by, why don't you tell people who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is uh, Scott Harris King, and um, I am in my uh, secret identity, my, my private life, I'm a writer. So uh, I currently write for a company that makes YouTube videos. I won't get into it too much. It's a top secret, but if uh, you watch a lot of videos on YouTube, there's a good chance you've seen some of the ones that I've written the scripts for. Ah, cool. Um, and uh, so I'm also just a big comic book fan. Uh, I started reading comics at the beginning of 1984. And as soon as I started reading comics, I immediately knew I wanted to make comics. But it, the barriers, the gatekeepers always seemed so difficult to break through that I just never did it um, until a couple of years ago. I was finally like, you know, with the print on demand technology and the digital formats and then Kickstarter allowing you to bypass those gatekeepers and go directly to your audience. Um, it sort of removed all the barriers. The only barrier left was just my mental blocks against creating it. So then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to write it. I'm just going to draw it. And so that's how my comic, The Crime Busters, came about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, too. Uh, I'm, I'm old school. I was uh, doing zines with my wife back in the early 90s and, you know, going to Kinko's and trying to make your own stuff. And the barrier to entry to go from somebody, you know, printing six copies at Kinko's to getting actually published in a comic book and that was really hard so this is a this is a golden age for people to create yeah i i mean i'm really passionate about indie comics right now um, particularly kickstarter um i do some local conventions uh, i've been doing this um i started working on my first issue of my series of crime busters in the fall of 2018 so it's just over two years ago when i first started in on this and I've started doing some of the uh, the local scene, and it's just great to go, particularly to conventions that focus on independent creators, people like me who are you know passionate about making their own books. But the way Kickstarter just allows you to take that experience to everybody in the world, um, it's just it's fantastic. And there's so many great projects on Kickstarter that you can never find at a comic book store because they're things right. that the big publishers would just never take a chance on. Um, that I think it's uh, just as a as a someone who loves the medium and loves reading comics and collecting comics, the breadth of material available on Kickstarter is just it's just amazing. Well, right now with with the lack of opportunities to uh, be live at a convention, uh, Kickstarter has become you know the lifeblood of the indie comic scene, which is uh, very cool. I mean, I can't believe how many cool projects I've been finding, how many people I've been interviewing with these great projects, and. Uh, that includes you. This Crime Busters thing is super cool. Can you explain what Crime Busters is? Sure. Well, the short elevator pitch that I, the one line that I give people is that it's kind of like Scooby Doo meets Cthulhu. Now, <laughs> you already have me. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> Um, I'll say that in these early issues, because I do have a, I'll get into this, uh, you know, later in the conversation, I have a long term sort of plot line plan. And so in these early issues, some of the, the Cthulhu, you know, the mystical elements are, they're a little bit lighter, um, but they're definitely there. As a kid, you know, I grew up, um, you know, in the late 70s and the early 80s, Scooby-Doo was on all the time. Every day it was on in the oh, afternoon yeah. reruns and stuff. And I really disliked it. And the reason I didn't like it is because it was it was never actually a ghost. It was never actually a monster. It was always a guy in a rubber costume or someone with a video projector projecting a ghost. And I always wanted it there to be some actual like magic, some actual stuff. So when I decided when I really got into doing Crime Busters, what I wanted to do is have that Scooby Doo vibe and have that sort of homage to the all these sort of teen detective stories that I loved so much as a kid. But I wanted there to have a world where it's possible that maybe there is magic, maybe there are monsters, maybe there are demons. And so in the stories I've been doing so far, what I try to do is actually leave it kind of open to the reader. I present options where I've got a couple different detectives, um, Chuck Chandler and Trixie Trouble are my 
two characters that work together. Great names. Then, um, thank you. And so a lot of times they'll have debates in the stories. Like one of them might think this is magic and the other one's like, no, you know, it could be something else. There's always different explanations. And I try and leave it a little open to the reader to decide for themselves, like, was this a ghost or was it just, you know, a guy with a video projector? And uh, that's been a lot of fun to sort of add that element to, to the sort of these classic Scooby-Doo stories. Yeah, I'm kind of getting a, uh, when I was looking through it, I was getting kind of an X-Files vibe too, kind of like a, uh, I want to say almost like an Archie meets Nancy Drew meets the X-Files with monsters. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's a great space to be in, you know? X-Files was was certainly one of my inspirations um, in terms of the uh, relationship between Chuck and Trixie. Chuck's very much of a skeptic, you know, he's sort of like, he's always a yeah, there's always a scientific explanation, whereas Trixie's more like open to the idea that maybe there's, maybe it's a wizard, you know, maybe it's a demon, maybe it's a ghost, and um, because uh, it's just more fun for her if those things were real. She wants them to be real, and so she's a little bit more open eyed and so the two of them sort of have that interplay, and Archie, you can tell just by looking at my art style, obviously I've specifically patterned it after the classic Archie style, the Dan DiCarlo art style. Yeah, and, and it's um, great too. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, the art, you know, uh, I was an art minor in college. I took some classes on how to draw comics. I don't know if you remember in the 90s, there was a guy by the name of Paul Ryan who was doing a lot of work for Marvel and DC. He did like all the big books. He was the regular artist on Superman and Iron Man, Fantastic Four, Avengers. He did all those titles. Um, I was lucky enough to take a class from him where he was teaching me some of how the storytelling art stuff, but I never felt like my art was quite, it, it wasn't I didn't feel like it was up to the the sort of standard that Marvel and DC would do. And I eventually realized that just wasn't my style. Uh, once I started getting outside of the big two and this, this sort of how to draw comics the Marvel way and started looking at other publishers like Archie, I realized I was much more comfortable with a more cartoony style. And I'll say one of the big influences for me is Archie had this series that ran for a long time that ended in 1991 called life with Archie and they did a lot of long form more serious stories than their regular gag strips and they included a lot of stories where they would be like a wizard would turn Veronica into a cat and Archie had to find like rescue her and figure out like and there would be like Frankenstein would show up and um you know there was one with like where they get trapped in like an Incan temple and there's like this this cursed medallion and they're going to be sacrificed to the gods and stuff and those reading those stories but drawn in the archie style convinced me that that style will work for for sort of adventure stories and so that's where i ended up with this sort of art style for crime busters well it's it's really cool and it's such a cool concept um it's just a lot of fun and i see when i look through it uh not to go too far off topic, but you do have uh, another title I keep, a couple of them I see on here. One looks very Nancy Drewish, and then Boy? What is Boy? So, one of the characters... I know we're going like, offset of, no, uh, of the Kickstarter, but it, it's just, it's intriguing. Well, it's something that if you look at my Kickstarter, this will come up, because I do this for every Kickstarter. One thing I like to do, uh, I'm a comic book collector. Um, you know, in addition to reading comics and creating comics, I collect comics, and I and I love comics history. And one of the inspirations for making this series in particular is I'm a huge fan of this golden age comic called Boy Comics. And the lead character is called Crime Buster. And that's my character, Chuck Chandler, because he's actually in the public domain. And over the years, I put together a complete run of Boy Comics with the Crime Buster strip, which is 117 issues. It ended in 1956. And when I got to the end of the series, I was thinking to myself, man, I wish there were more issues. I want to know what happens next. I want to see what would have happened with the character as he developed. And then I realized, well, he's in the public domain. I can do that myself. Yeah. And so one thing that I do here, and you don't need to know anything about the character or anything about this. This is really kind of just from my own personal enjoyment. But um, I actually picked up on some of the supporting characters and a little bit of the continuity from the original series. So this series, in keeping with this sort of classic sort of teen detective Nancy Drew feel that I want, 
this the series is set in 1956 which is when the original boy comics run ended so one thing i do with the kickstarter is every issue i have a boy comics variant cover that you can buy which has the old logo from that series and continues the numbering from the original series oh so cool crime busters number one has a boy comics number 120 variant because the the last uh, issue of the original series was um issue 119 which you can yeah i so, see it yeah oh, so that's fantastic what a great idea so uh once i had decided to do that and again there are a few people that buy those in particular because i do have some of my readers that are hardcore like golden age comic collectors like me or they're people that like the go the public age dom public domain characters and so they want that cover but I really wanted to make sure that the series was equally balanced between the two main characters, Chuck and Trixie. And Trixie is sort of my homage to those, those classic teen detective novels. I loved them as a kid. Um, I was a huge fan in particular of Trixie Belden. And that's why I named the character as an homage to Trixie Belden, but also Nancy Drew and just that whole sort of um, tradition. The Three Investigators was a series I loved. So what I decided to do was also every issue I do another series of variant covers called Trixie's Mysteries where the cover is done to look like a Nancy Drew book cover. Yeah, see, and I thought those were different books when I glanced at them. Those are fantastic. They look just like a Nancy Drew book. Thanks. Um, and I drew the first one myself, but um, what I'm doing is I have a very, very small platform right now. I'm hoping to grow it, but I wanted to use that platform to highlight some of the other great indie creators working in the same space as me. So with the Trixie's Mysteries in particular, starting with issue two, I'm having a guest artist who do each of the variant covers for the Trixie's Mysteries, starting with number two, and they're all going to be... Um, female comic creators working in the indie comic space so i can give at least a little bit of a platform to show off their work the issue two for instance i had a, an artist named heather farrington did the cover she has an indie series that she does herself called uh, juvenile diversion and then here for the new one issue three is julie oliviera and her comic is called camp bitter lake and it's also sort of a group of young detectives investigating a supernatural mystery at their like uh summer camp so i'm seeing a crossover in the future well we'll see we'll see but that's <laughs> so you know that's that's where those those came from so those it's the same content inside but it's just um for the people Variant that are coming covers, at yeah. the series from different angles i have people that just buy the trixie mysteries covers i have some people that just collect for the boy comics covers and then most of the people just get the regular cover but there's there's people that um, you know just really like that that uh, look and um, I love it and it's sort of paying homage to the different inspirations that brought me to create the series. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I find all of these covers really striking. I can see why people would want to get all three, which uh, is what you really ultimately would love, right? Yeah. Um, every time I have. Uh, a one of my reward levels is always you know the set of all the covers i do a fourth variant a fourth cover for each one as well and that's a kickstarter exclusive cover and that's just so that the people you know buying on kickstarter if they want to get something that's just for my backers you know the other copies you know the other covers if i go to conventions i'll have those available so if you want a trixie's mysteries cover and you see me at a show in boston you can get it there but I wanted to, for my Kickstarter audience, because I love Kickstarter so much, I decided to do a Kickstarter exclusive cover for every issue that's only available on Kickstarter. Um, yeah. And so one thing I do is I'll have available as one of my reward levels, a set of all the covers. So for this one, there's one of the reward levels is the set of all four covers for issue three. And those have actually been pretty popular. Um, that's one of the, the, the top sort of reward levels for each of the three um kickstarter campaigns i've run so far has been the set of all the covers for that particular issue well i i can understand why because when i'm looking at them each of them is so distinctly different and so cool that you feel like if i have to choose one i'm gonna choose all four yeah uh and one thing i want to say is like kickstarter as you probably know they're rolling out this new they're beta testing uh the add-ons that you can do now inside kickstarter so you don't have to use crowdox or backer kit and uh so now when you if you're part of this beta test which my kickstarter i'm lucky enough to be part of when you click on the pledge 
it brings you to a new screen where it's got add-ons and it's and that's made it very so much simpler for me as someone who has all these variant covers to allow people to just sort of select exactly what combination of covers. Cause now I've got three issues and they all have at least three variants. And so it could have a, be a big mess for me on the, you know, if I had to list them all out of separate pledge levels, it would just be a disaster. But now right. I don't have to do that. I basically have the basic sets, but if you don't want those, you can just select a single issue, go to the add-ons, and then you can just pick and choose. Like, I want the boy comics cover for number two. I want the Trixie cover for number three. I want the Kickstarter exclusive for this one. And just sort of package your own thing. I'm so happy that Kickstarter has added the add-ons as part of their own system. Because it just for people like me at my level, it makes it so much easier to to do and less confusing for the backers trying to figure out how to get what they want. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So let's, let's talk about the business side of it for a second. Um, you have 14 days to go as of the recording of this. So by the time it airs, it'll be like 13 days to go. Uh, at this moment, your goal was 800 bucks. You've already hit it. Hey, hey congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so you're at 1,022 right now. You've got 40 backers. Uh, so now we're just, we're just trying to go for those stretch goals. I know you've got a stretch goal at 50 backers. So uh, that one I'm really intrigued by. I, this is actually one of my favorite stretch goals that people do. Uh, at 50 backers, you get audio commentary tracks. Uh, I'm a podcaster. I love that. Love it. And I love hearing the creators talk about what's going on in the books and that. It's, it's just fantastic. And then you have uh, another stretch goal uh, of digital rewards. Do you have more beyond these? I do. I have more planned. I'm hesitant to, for me personally, when I do my Kickstarters, I'm hesitant to, to list even potential stretch goals until they, they're in play because I don't want to presume um, that we're going to hit those goals. You know, I don't want to be like, hey, here's my next five stretch goals. Uh, I, for me personally, it feels a little presumptuous. I don't want to to be going, Hey, I know we're going to hit like $1,900. Um, so here's the, the thing you really want is at the $1,900 mark or something like that. So I have some in mind and what I, the way I usually do it is if we hit the $1,100 stretch goal, I'll unveil a new stretch goal for $1,300. I have rewards already in mind for that. Um, and it's the same with the number of backers. Um, I have something in mind for 75 backers. So if we hit 50, I'll unveil a new stretch goal for 75. Um, I know a lot of people tie their stretch goals to the dollar amount. Uh, for me personally, um, particularly with this Kickstarter, I'm actually a little bit less concerned with the dollar amount and more. I just want people to read it, right? So I, I'm more concerned with, I want more backers to come in and experience it. Um, this time around, a lot of the rewards are, you know, um, the comic itself. I don't have a lot of bells and whistles outside of the comic. And so what that means for me as, as a creator on the business side is that returning um, backers who were, have pledged for both of the previous campaigns, they already have a lot of the rewards. And so just by default, they're, they're going to be selecting reward tiers that are at the lower end because they're just not sure. going to be buying as much. And so I'm less concerned with trying to hit a certain like huge dollar amount or make a bunch of money as I am to just, I'd rather have someone come in at, I'd rather have three people come in at $10 each than one person come in at 30 because I want to share it with more people. So that's why right. I'm starting to do more stretch goals that are based on the number of backers sure. um, rather than the dollar amount. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And like I said, I looked at these and went, oh, these are great stretch goals. I, I can see how they would be incentivizing me, but you're within shooting distance of both of these. I mean, you're, you're 40 backers right now. You get to 50, you've got it. Well, you've got time. You're going to hit that 50. I am confident. At $1,100, you're, you're within spitting distance of that too. So I really, uh, I really like how you're doing that. Um, what is that, the treasure chest of digital rewards? I didn't read through uh, to the audience what that is. Do you want to explain it? Sure. The The digital awards um, is basically a, a couple things that I'm going to be doing. So because I'm working with characters, some characters that are in the public domain, it actually gives me the opportunity to do some really great things with the digital war rewards specifically. And that is 
because some of these characters like Chuck Chandler, my main character is in the public domain. I can actually include his original golden age stories in the PDF. I don't, for cost concerns, I can't really put it in the comic itself because I have to pay for the printing. But since there's no cost with the PDF, what that means is for the previous issues, in addition to the story you get, uh, I've been adding in some of his golden age stories. So the PDFs that I've been sending out to people, um, in the, my comic is quite long. You know, it's the first issue is 36 pages of comic stories. The, the next, and the, this one's 38. And um, so they take a while to read, but the PDF for the first issue, for instance, is actually 93 pages long because there's an additional 40 pages of stories at the end from the golden age. Wow. And as, as a golden age fan and historian for, it's been great for me because for instance, issue one, it makes reference. Again, you don't have to know any of the stuff. It's just sort of, it, it's the, there. They're like Easter eggs that are hidden in there. Exactly. So I, I had just as a very vague jumping off point, a story in Boy Comics number seven that inspired me to be like, oh, what if this happened? And that's why I created my story. So when I, and some of the characters, the supporting characters that played minor roles appeared in the last issue 119. So what I did was in the PDF for issue one, I reprinted those included those stories so you could read the original stories from the 40s and 50s that were the inspiration for this and get all that now you don't need any of that to enjoy the current the new story but if you want to read all that stuff um and so basically what this is is if we hit the 1100 dollars i'm going to add some extra stories i've got some cameos from some other golden age characters that are in the public cool. domain and so I'm going to basically just add some extra stuff. Additionally, um, I'm going to have some wallpapers, both for like your computer, but also your phone. I did this last time for issue two and people seem to like it, or at least I like it. I actually have it as my own phone wallpaper is the one that I made <laughs> for issue two. So I thought, well, I'm going to do the same thing with some of the art for issue three, make them into different wallpapers. And then I've got some stuff, some art from issue one that I never did that with. So the digital package here is basically all backers at all levels, including just PDF. You'll get an enhanced PDF with a bunch of extra content, but you'll also get a bunch of digital wallpapers for different devices and stuff. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. All right, Scott. So where can people, I, I know that they can go to Kickstarter and they can follow this and we'll put the links in the show notes, but they can look up crime busters number one through three supernatural mystery adventure. That's what it's under on Kickstarter. Where can people reach you uh, through social media? Uh, so the two easiest places to find me, and I mean, they're all easy enough, but the ones that I focus my energy on really, the main thing is I have a, you know, a website for crime busters. It's just called crimebustercomics.com. Uh, so if you go there, it'll have links to everywhere else. And it's also just sort of, a, a, you can jump to the Kickstarter, you can, um, follow everything else. Uh, the other thing is I do have a YouTube channel. That's where I sort of focus my attention in terms of social media. I just find it um, as a storyteller, uh, I find the YouTube to be the most fun and interesting place for me to interact with people. It's just so sure. much easier to tell a story on a video. So my channel is called uh, The Classic Comic Collector. Um, and I do a lot of different content on there. It's not just about crime busters. I talk about collecting old comics and reading old comics as well but I also talk about the process of making comics. So if you're interested in sort of behind the scenes, look at how comics are made and printed. Like I've done videos on that. And I talk about the process of things like updating golden age characters for modern stories and how my thought process on that. So I guess those would be the main places. I also have um, stuff on like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, if you go there, like uh, just look up the crime busters, I'll pop up. Uh, but I would say, you know, crimebustercomics.com uh, or um, the classic comic collector on YouTube. Those are probably the best places to find me. Yeah, and I just subscribed to you on YouTube. So. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, really cool. All right, Scott. Well, thank you very much. Good luck with this. I want to see those stretch goals opening up. Uh, and please, anybody listening, uh, share this. So whether you give or not. As, uh, as Scott said, he wants people reading this material. So the more he can get reached, the better. Share it on your social media. Let people know about the Kickstarter. Let them know about Crime Busters. It's going to do nothing but help Scott out. And this really deserves it. I think this is so cool. I love what you've got going here. I think this Kickstarter is a real winner. So uh, I really hope that you get the support that you truly deserve. 
thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you for having me on.